if I can make a, a, an amendment to this song? It's not just how we fight, but this is how we win. Woo! Because way too many people are fighting, but they're losing. And way too many people think they're fighting, but they're shadow boxing. And all they're hitting is nothing. And I'm telling you, when you throw the right, when you throw the left, the right jab hook, you're not going to miss, but it's going to land on the chin. Kind of get a hallelujah. It's going to land right on the chin. Come on, come on. Hit me, baby, one more time. Anyways. But guys, this is not just how we fight. This is how we win. This is how we win. This is how we win. Come on, amen. Come on. You are a winner. Winner. Chicken dinner. Praise God. Give me some chicken, Jesus. Some fried chicken. But anyways, guys. We're so, we're so glad because we're winners. Amen. And that's what I'm going to be talking and teaching you Saturday morning on my session, closing session on overcoming spiritual warfare. Amen. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be awesome. But guys, uh, we just got Bob Hazlitt here. And uh, you know, I want all of you to give the worship team another round of applause. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. And then uh, we're going to have... Uh, the man of God, Bob Hazlitt here, and we're so excited because, Brother Bob, you're sharing on the third session of our Open Heavens online experience, and we're believing for a great move of God, something supernatural, even as you're coming on here. So we appreciate you, man of God. We love you. We receive you. And uh, just please be free and feel free. You have full reign, freedom to just share your heart and to release impartation in this time in Jesus' name. So everybody... I want you to give the man of God, Bob, has a big round of applause. Come on. Are you ready? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Sorry, I had to switch from my uh, from my webcam to my laptop, but we are here. And it's good to be here with you online. I want to talk to you today. Uh, a message that the Lord gave me for you. In fact, as we were worshiping, wasn't that just amazing worship today? An incredible time of worship. And as we were worshiping, I really felt like the Lord was speaking to me uh, from Exodus 33. I'm going to read to you the scripture. And Moses said, now show me your glory. It's interesting, this question that he starts with a statement. He he asked the question, now show me your glory. I want to see your glory. But he starts it with the statement, now. And think about that. Of all the things that you experience before you experience now, before you experience a now. And a Jesus, and we're getting into to, to ready to celebrate Holy Week, you know. And Jesus had so many prophetic words about his life. But it wasn't until the fullness of time came that God sent his son into the world. There's a now. So Isaiah 9 says, For unto you a child is born, unto you a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. And that Isaiah 9 prophecy came into a, a, a sphere, an event um, of a, a nation that was in gloom. It says at the beginning of Isaiah 9, for unto you, Galilee, a son is born. Unto you, Galilee, a child is given. And nevertheless, there will be no more gloom. I believe that God is removing away the gloom that wants to come over your life. I believe he's removing away the gloom that's tried to come through your television sets. He's removing away the gloom. And, and whenever it says in Isaiah chapter 9, for unto you, a son is born, he's saying, I'm taking away the gloom that's tried to overwhelm you. And as we were worshiping, I just felt like the Lord saying is the gloom is lifting. And, and now he's going to show you his glory. You see, Moses had experienced a lot of things. He had experienced a, being part of a generation that was supposed to be destroyed. But now he was asking to see the glory of God. He was untreated unjustly because he was a Hebrew slave living in an Egyptian household, and, and because he had a passion to see his people set free, he responded incorrectly. Because when you respond correctly to your purpose, when you respond out of pain to your purpose, you can sometimes respond incorrectly prematurely. And so he incorrectly and prematurely tried to become a deliverer. He incorrectly and prematurely 
killed an Egyptian slave driver. Why? Because he wanted to see God's glory. He wanted to see God's purpose. He wanted to see God do what he was called to do. But there's a time for you to experience your now. And sometimes what happens is you experience things before your now that don't look like the glory. It doesn't look like that. And so Moses experienced these things. He experienced being a fugitive. He experienced uh, being a foreigner in a foreign land. He experienced coming back to a nation where his people were being mistreated. And he experienced a deliverance. But he was saying, like, right now, I need to see your glory. And in the context in which he says this, I believe that there's a context for us to say, God, now we, we want to see your glory. Like, we've, we've seen this year start off with great promise, and we've seen now great problems. We've seen a great plague. We've seen things happen. But I, I believe there's a moment where we can say, now, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory, God. And I believe he wants to show you his glory. And, and, and how is it, how's it going to happen? What's it going to look like? Well, here's what happens. G Moses said to God, you've been telling me, leave these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I, will, I know you by name, and you have, found, uh, you have found favor with me. If you're pleased with me, teach me your ways. That's very important because before you can see God's glory, you have to understand God's ways. There's a lot of questions that Moses could have asked here. Moses could have asked, hey, tell me what the plan is. Because in this moment he was in, in the now moment that he was in, in the present situation he was in, he had people complaining against him. He had a mutiny among his leadership. He had financial a lack of financial and physical resources. He didn't have the things that were needed and necessary for uh, the people to be fed and for them to have food. And he's in a situation where he could say, God, now show me where the water is. Now show me where the food is. Now, God, show me who's going to be, uh, who's going to be honor honest with me. Who's going to be faithful to me. Who's not going to betray me in this. He needs to get his people out of the wilderness into the promised land. He could have said, if it were me, look, I wouldn't be asking, show me your way. I'd be saying, tell me what the plan is. You see, I'm, I'm one of those people that I want to know what the plan is. Tell me where we're going. You know, and I was a kid and, and we were going on vacation. My dad came home one day and said, hey, we're going to Disneyland. We're going to Disney World. We lived in Pennsylvania. Disney World in Florida is 25-hour drive away. And when he said, we're going to Disney World, I had a destination. I had a plan. I, I, knew under, I understood something. But then, you know, when we got into that station wagon, you know, those good old station wagons with the powder blue with the wood paneling on the side. And, and we got in there with all the five kids and all the, the old, my dad would put all that luggage on top and wrap it around with twine and, and get on the road. Uh, I'm just a few minutes out of the driveway. And I, I say, Dad, when are we going to get there? That's a, that's a typical kid question, isn't it? When are we going to get there? Why? Because I wanted to know what the plan was. When are we going to get there? What are we going to do when we get there? And my dad, I remember him looking back at me and saying that dad answer, we will get there when we get there. Now, that's not the answer a kid wants to have. And so, you know, that satisfied me for a couple minutes. And then my next question, 15 minutes later, was when are we going to get there, dad? When are we going to get there? And after asking that question, you know, five or six times in the first a few minutes or for the, the first couple hours of drive of driving, my dad turned around and said, son, get in the back. <laughs> get in fact, it was the back back. He put me in the, the back back seat, which in that station wagon, you know how that is. You are looking backward, but you're facing forward or you're driving forward. So it, it's terrible if you're a prophetic kid to be actually, I feel like I'm moving forward, but all I can see is my past. You know what I'm saying? Because you want to know the plan. You want to know, you want to be able to see forward. You want to be able to look forward. You want to be able to understand what's forward. And sometimes we don't get that answer. Sometimes we are not getting the answer from God we want because we're asking the wrong question. And sometimes we're asking, what's going to happen next? Where am I going to get what I need? What are we going to do with, with what we don't have? When is this going to end? And God is saying, we'll get there when we get there. What, is my, what was my father saying? What he was saying is, son, I'm driving right now. I know the destination. 
I know how to get you there. Can I tell you something? You're about to see God's glory. Not because you say, God, tell me what to do. Tell me what's going to happen. But because you say, God, show me your way. He didn't say, give me the plan. He didn't say, give me the provision. He didn't say, give me the people that I need to get me to the next place. He said, I need to, I need your person. And when you don't have a plan and when you feel like you can't see where the provision is coming from and you don't feel like there's the right people around you, guess what you have? You have the person. You have the person of Jesus. You have the person of the Holy Spirit. You have the person of the Father. And, and Moses asked the right question. He said, God, teach me your ways so that I may know you. Here's the good thing. You know what? Some people might understand the plan, but if you, don't, if you know the person, even if you can't understand the plan, you can trust. And that's what God is teaching you to know. Teach me your way so that I may know you and that I may continue to find favor with you. Now, this is awesome. What Moses is doing right here is he's declaring something. I know you're pleased with me. Teach me your way so that I may know you and continue to have favor with you. And remember, these people are your people. What, what is he saying to God? First of all, God, you've been good to me. I've had favor with you. Now, I need to know I'm going to continue to have favor. Show me your way. And God replies to him, it's a beautiful statement, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us from this place, how will anyone know you're pleased with us and with your people unless you are with us? And what else will distinguish us from all the other people on the face of the earth? And God grants his request. And Moses says, now show me your glory. He made a good request. And I want to tell you, sometimes we get the answer to the prayer that we prayed, but it doesn't look like what we thought it would look like. What happens when, God, when Moses says, now show me your glory? You can't know the, or see the glory of God until you can understand his ways. Because if you don't understand his ways, if you don't know his person, you'll see, you won't see the provision and so you'll lose faith faith in the person. You won't see the people around you getting in line with you or the people that are supposed to support you. So you lose faith in the person of who he is. You won't see necessarily see the plan. So you lose faith in the person. Don't lose faith in the person of G who Jesus is. He has a way. And I want to describe to you his ways today. I want to talk about his ways, because if you can understand his ways, then you can see his glory. And so he says, now, show me your glory. Somebody just say that with me. Now, God, I've seen some good, bad stuff this year. I've seen some tough stuff this year. But now, show me your glory. Yeah, I've watched the media and I've listened to the experts. But now, show me your glory. God, I've done everything that I've done that I could do to stand. I've social distanced myself. I've washed my hands a hundred times a day. But now, show me your glory. And all I'm saying is that, God wants you to see his glory, but you have to understand his ways because if you don't understand his ways, you won't recognize his glory when it shows up. And this is what I want to talk to you about. God, Moses says, now show me your glory. And God says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Here's what I saw during worship today for you guys, I literally saw God's glory passing by you. And I saw him proclaiming his name. His glory is coming into your house and he's proclaiming his name. What is his name? I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. You remember the, the Israelites when they're in their homes during Passover and, and whenever their, their blood was on their posts of their door, the Lord passed over his mercy and his compassion is on your house. His mercy and his compassion is on your house. And so as God is passing by with his mercy and his compassion, he's proclaiming his name. Watch what he does to Moses. This is, a, this is an incredible story. In verse 21, it says, so, okay, there's a place near me 
where you can stand on a rock when my glory passes by. Now, there's something that if we, if we took it out of context, we could just preach this. There's a place near me where I'm going to show my glory to you. Man, God's going to bring you near to himself, and he's going to show you his glory. Man, God's going to put you on a high place. He's going to lift you up on a platform. And I could just get my preach on and my prophesy on saying, look, God is about to lift you up to a high place. He's going to put you on a rock, and he's going to bring him close to you, and he's going to demonstrate his glory through you. And I would be correct to say that, but I would be incomplete to say only that because he said, there's a place near me where you can stand on a rock when my glory passes by, but I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. We're in a cleft of the rock situation right now. We're still on the rock. He's still near us, but there's a cleft in the rock. There's an old hymn of the church. I grew up in the church. We grew up singing, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock and he covers me there with his hand. It's beautiful to sing, but it's a harder picture to look at. Basically what he's saying is, look, I'm gonna pass by, but for a season, I'm gonna put you in a cleft of the rock. What's a cleft? It's a cave, guys, it's a hole. It's a, it's a, it's a confined space. It's a dark space. It's a place where your natural vision is impeded. It's a silent place. It's a place where your natural ears are impeded it's a it's a it's a place of confinement it's a place where your natural movement is confined he's in a cleft and if that's not bad enough he says and i'm going to cover you with my hand what does that mean there's i'm going to put you in a place where there's only one exit and then i'm going to block the exit i'm going to cover it with my hand can i tell you something you're not confined by a law or government or even a disease You're in the hand of the Lord right now, and he's covering you because he's about to pass by with his glory. And when his glory passes by, he judges his enemies. When his glory passes by, he destroys those things. You remember in in, uh, 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 whatever that is, 2020, believe in his prophets and, and, and you will have success, right? Second Chronicles 20, it says that whenever they sang and praised that the glory of the, of the Lord came down, the glory of the Lord came down on the battlefield. How do I know that was the glory of God? Because the song that they sang was give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And that song was always a song that was sung when the glory came. And so when Jehoshaphat in, in second Chronicles twenty twenty said, send out the praisers and sing, that, uh, that Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. This was the song that was sung by Solomon in the dedication of the temple and the glory came down. This was the song that was sung by Ezra and Nehemiah and the glory came down. This was the song that was sung every time the Ark of the Covenant was present. And when the Ark of the Covenant was present in the battle, the glory would come and they would win the battle. And, uh, and Jehoshaphat in in Second Chronicles 20, he didn't have the physical ark of God, but he still had the song of the Lord. He still had the praise of God in his mouth. And when he began to sing and worship, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. What is he singing? He's singing what God said his name is. I will proclaim my name before you, that I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. God was setting Moses up to see his glory because he was revealing who he was, what his way was. He's merciful. He's compassionate. And let me tell you something. When you can stand in the middle of a situation and say, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever, you're about to see the glory of God pass by. And in 2 Chronicles 20, what happens is the glory comes into that battlefield. The enemy gets completely confused. They destroy each other. And then God's people get the plunder from the battle. This is where that story comes from right here because one man said god look i could get a temporary plan and get out of this i could get some new people to follow me and i'll get out of this i could go back to egypt and get my provisions and i get out of this but god i want i want to see your glory i want to know your ways i don't just want the plan i don't just want the provision i don't just want the people i want your person i need to see your glory i need to know your ways and so god puts moses in the cleft of the rock And he says, I'm going to cover you. And as I cover you, my glory will pass by as I put you in the cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hands until I have passed by. Until I have passed by. And I tell you something, you're not just in your house today. 
you're in a cleft of the rock. You're not just in your home under quarantine. You're in the cleft of the rock. And God's glory is passing by, and I believe he's coming to destroy this enemy. I believe he's coming to fight this battle for us. And he says, afterward, I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but not my face for my face must not be seen. That word back is actually the behind parts or the after parts, really God's backside, basically what it is. You know how when we get, we get kind of upset with somebody who say, talk to the hand, you know, we walk away. Well, that's basically what God's saying. Look, you're, you're, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. This battle is going on right now. You're under a mutiny. You, you, you have a lack of resources. Your people are rising against you. you. You don't know the plan how to get out of this. So I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. And right now, I'm going to pass by. And when I do, I'm going to destroy your enemy. And I'm just going to, basically going to say to the enemy, talk to my hand right now. There's nothing else you can do. I put you in the past. You will see my afterward. Do you know what the enemy wants to do? He wants to make you think that what you're going through is you're going to come out of this looking worse than you came into it. You're going to come out poor. You're going to come out sicker. You're going to come out broke. You're going to come out tired and weary. I'm telling you, you're going to come out filled with the glory of God. You know why? When, when Moses, when, when God said, you're going to see my afterward, what happened was, is he was saying, you're going to see the afterward of what happens when I pass by in a battle. You're going to see the afterward of what happens when I pass by in, in um, provision, when you have a lack of provision. You're going to see the afterward. Now, let me tell you something. You're about to see the afterward of God showing up in your life. You're about to see the afterward of when God passes by your family. You're about to see the afterward. Because the devil may have his chance to say something now, but God's got the last word. He's got the afterword. And God's got an afterword for you. What happens after he, the devil steals? Well, uh, the afterword is that the thief may steal, kill, and destroy, but God comes that you might have life and life to the full. God gets the afterword. You know, whatever you're going through now, God has an afterword for you. Maybe you've gone through a divorce. God has an afterword for that. Maybe you've gone through a, a business bankruptcy or betrayal. God has an afterword for that. Maybe you've actually uh, contracted symptoms. Maybe you've had family members even that have, have, have gotten, maybe you've had family members that die. I have people very close with me battling right now. And I want to tell you something. We understand we're in a battle. But can I tell you something? God has an afterword. He has an afterword. And I want to see his afterword. I want to see his afterword. There, you know why it's important? To see the afterword of God, he said, no man can see my face. My face must not be seen. Here's one of the reasons I believe. When Moses came out of this um, situation, when Moses came out of the cleft of the rock, how did he come out? He came out with the glory of God on his face. He came out looking different. He came out with his face shining because while he was in the cleft of the rock, he couldn't see, but he was looking at God. He, when it, while he was in the cleft of the rock, he couldn't hear, but he was learning to hear God in a new way. He couldn't um, physically con connect with God the way he did before. But when he came out, he came out of the confinement with new eyes. He came out of the confinement with, with new ears. He came out of the confinement with a new face on him. And what I, what I love about this is that God is about to show you the afterword of what you're going through. God's about to show you the afterword of what you've experienced. And when we come out, we're going to come out looking like him. And this word glory is a beautiful, beautiful word. In fact, there's a parallel passage to this in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You may be familiar with it. It's, it's a very important one because the story of Moses' uh, experience God was, is a powerful one. But there's actually a parallel story in 2 Corinthians 13. And and here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says in 2 Corinthians 3, uh, verse number 8, he says, And we who with unveiled face are reflecting the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. Or actually, another translation more properly says, from glory to glory. You're going from glory to to glory. Somebody say, I'm going to a greater glory. You know, this is where I wish I had my, you know, my pulpit. And this is where I had my organist in the background and my choir and my shouting hallelujahs, because I, I, some things, you know, 
they have to be said in a certain accent. If I'm going to order, you know, Mexican food, I'm going to order it with a Mexican accent, even though I'm not Latino. I'm going to say, give me some enchiladas, you know, I don't want an enchilada. I want enchilada. And there's some things that even like you need to say preacher words with preacher sound like glory. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't just say, well, the glory of God is all around you. No, this is the glory of God. This is the glory of God. And and I believe there's a greater glory that God wants to put us into. I think the issue is that sometimes we have church words that we say or spiritual words we say or Bible words we say. We don't really understand you know, what they mean. So let me just give you a natural analogy of the glory of God. It's an easy one for us all to understand, especially guys like me. It's this word bacon, right? Bacon is like the glory to me. Like I had today, my, my daughter was cooking me some eggs and we didn't have any bacon around the house. I'm like, this just doesn't feel like, this just feels like, you know, a non-spirit filled meeting right now because, you know, bacon is like when it, when you cook it, what happens? There's a cloud, man. That's like the glory of God. You know, the, the, the smell of bacon doesn't just fill your house. It actually fills your clothes. You start to smell like bacon yourself. You know, you, you become bacon. You don't just eat bacon. You become bacon, right? It's you, the reason is, is because, it creates a residue around it. Food, that food, and I'm sorry for you that are non-bacon eaters. You can do turkey bacon or something like that. Be a little bit more kosher or whatever. All I'm saying is that there's a residue that comes forth when I cook bacon. And it feels like I become like bacon. Well, that was what mo happened to Moses. Moses is in the presence of God in this cave. And there's a residue that starts to rest on him. And when he comes out of the situation, the glory resides on him. His face shines with the glory of God. And I believe that that's still available for us, even in the new covenant, that there's, we can go from glory to glory. We can experience experiences with God. We can have meetings like this. We can have times in his presence. And there's, a, there's an outward thing that happens to us. You can see people like my wife, Whenever we would have phone conversations when we were, we were dating, she would always tell me, her parents would say, I, I could tell you've been talking to Bob because your eyes are glowing. Your eyes are bright. Your eyes are, and it was as if our conversation showed on her countenance, right? And there's a, there's a, a thing that can happen with us, with the presence of God, that actually just having that encounter leaves a residue on us. But there's something even deeper. There's actually another analogy for the glory I want to give you. And it's actually a natural analogy, but it's actually very spiritual. And so I read something recently that there's a scientific study that the longer you've been married to someone, uh, the more you are in love with them, you start to look like them. You actually start to look like each other. And the other, the exception to that is if you love your dog more than you love your wife, you look more like your dog. I don't know. That's just science. I don't know how it works, but uh, what that, the, the science behind it is this. The more my wife and I have face-to-face -face communication, we start to mimic sort of our facial muscles and we begin to start to form facial features that are similar because the more you look at someone, the more you look like that person. The more you look at something, something, what you behold, you become. What are you looking at right now? What... What God was doing with Moses in the cave is really trying to get his eyes off the circumstances, trying to get his eyes off of the, the people that were persecuting him, the provision that he needed and the plan to escape that he didn't have. What are you looking at right now? Because that's not just what you're going to look like. It's actually because in the new covenant, it's not just a residue. The glory is not a residue. It's a residence. It takes up residence inside of you. It changes you from the inside out. It doesn't just show on your face, but it shows from the inside out. Why? Because it says we with unveiled faces are reflecting the Lord's glory because we are being transformed into his likeness from glory to glory. Here's my question for you right now. What are you looking at? Right now, what do you listen to? Right now, what is it that you're allowing to shape your thinking? Because what you're looking at right now is what you're going to look like when this is over. 
what you're looking at right now determines how you're going to look afterward. Afterward. And I believe we have a choice right now to make. You can binge watch all you want. Make it clean stuff, right? Binge watch good stuff. I'm binge watching some stuff with my daughter. She's loving it. I'm also doing bajillion Zoom calls and recording conferences and things like that. But, uh, but I'm, I'm taking my time binge watching. I'm also binge walking. I'm getting my body in shape. I'm getting my, you know, I don't want to get out, come out of this flabby. So I'm binge, I'm binge walking and I'm binge worshiping. Why? Because I want my spirit, my soul, and my body to be ready to go for what God has next. Because I believe the next season is the greatest awakening we've ever seen on the earth. And we're going to see his glory, the glory of the Lord, cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Man, that's, I wish, I wish I had some amens. I just wish I had some people that could say some amens to me. I'm just going to pop into this control panel and see if I can get some amens. Because whatever you're looking, whatever you're looking at is what you're going to look like. Whatever you're looking at. See, thank you, Kelly, for that amen. That's right, Sarah. The glory is, <laughs> yeah, the glory is coming right now into your home. Why? Because he's passing by you. He's passing by you, Denise. He's passing by your home. He's passing by your family. In fact, Denise, the Lord right now is going to visit some relatives during this time. And God, you're going to see salvation come to your entire household during this time. And three years ago, Denise, there was a, a, a loss of relationship that you thought you would never be able to step back into relationship that you could trust and that could be faithful to you. But I want to tell you, Denise, he's declaring over you that he's not just good and merciful and compassionate, but he's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. And in the next year, he's going to bring faithful relationships into your life that are going to walk after God and run after God the way that you are running after him. And I tell you something, I need someone to say, show me your glory. Because right now in the place, yes, you can have bacon, Camilla. It's really good for you. <laughs> but right now, I believe God is passing by. I believe he's passing by. Um, I don't remember the name of the, the worship leader that was leading worship earlier, but somebody shouted out to me because I have a word for her. And I really believe that God is passing by uh, her family, passing by her life. And um, I'm waiting for somebody to give me her name. All right, so I'm just going to prophesy to that worship leader. Um, as she is leading worship today, I saw um, these scales of justice over her head. And I feel like the injustice that you've gone through, Amanda, thank you, someone. Uh, Amanda, the injustice that you've gone through, God is about He's not going to balance the scales of justice. He's about to tip them. He's not going to make things fair. He's actually going to tip them in your favor. And I feel like there's even like a legal dispute that God is bringing against the enemy. The courts of heaven are meeting right now. And God is taking the enemy to court. He's canceling the case. And he's putting, I saw Jesus uh, take his last words written in his blood. That's it is finished on the cross. It's it's actually legal language for whenever there's evidence presented in court. And it means there's no case against you anymore. And you have to be paid back in full. And I believe that God is shifting the balance, the scales of justice in your favor to favor. This is going to be a season of favor. I feel like God is shifting something even in a living arrangements for you. There's going to be favor in, in increase in living arrangements. And this is going to be a year. In fact, I also believe that um, there's just some ministry things you were starting to step into, some recording things, some uh, things even in the entertainment industry that you thought you would step into. And it seemed like the enemy stole your payday uh, before you got your first paycheck. But God wants you to know your payday is in God's hands. Your payday is coming your way. Your payday is in the Lord's hands. So we just declare even the things that God's called you to do uh, in the uh, arena arena of art, artistry and entertainment, that the Lord is opening up a new door for you. So we just declare it in Jesus' name. Come on. I believe that God wants to pass by your home right now. I, I believe he wants to pass by with goodness in your neighborhood. I'm declaring my neighborhood and no corona zone. I believe that that God is bringing us to a place where we can um, believe even in a time when we feel like we've been in a dark place. And I feel like there's some people 
that have felt like they've been in a confined place. They've been in a dark place. They've been in a silent place. And you're saying, God, where are you? I can't hear you. I can't see you. And God is just passing by you with his goodness right now. You're going to see your afterward. You're going to see your afterward. Uh, Kellyanne, I just really believe that this is a year. I felt like the Lord said, you know, seven years ago, there were some things that the, the thief tried to come and steal in your life. But I feel like, Kellyanne, this is the year for God for the sevenfold return on your life, the sevenfold return of God. He's paying you back for seven years of famine, seven years of, of um, faithfulness. I saw you, um, Kelly, I saw you like almost like retooling your whole toolbox, re-educating yourself, uh, rewiring yourself. And I feel like the Lord is, is saying like, um, this is, you're coming to a graduation day and the enemy wanted to cancel your graduation day. But I believe the Lord say, no, this isn't just graduation. This is a uh, commencement. This is a commencement and a commencement is a finishing of a season and it is a, a release of a new season. So Kelly, this is your commencement day. Put on your graduation cap, Turn, take your tassel and flip it to the other side because I feel like the Lord is giving you li literally like a master's degree in the spirit. God is releasing a uh, greater um, revelation to you uh, in the season. And I saw the Lord uh, put a spirit of counsel on you and a spirit of power. And I, and I feel like the Lord is going to place you in a position, Kelly, <laughs> Kellyanne, to um, bring wise counsel to people that have gone through trauma, um, that have gone through sexual trauma, gone through developmental trauma, gone through childhood trauma. And I saw you as a, as a counselor, a spirit-filled counselor, and God connecting the spirit. This is part of the sevenfold spirits of God in Isaiah 11. God is taking the spirit of counsel and the spirit of power, bringing them together and putting them in your hands. Happy graduation day. And, and you're going to have, are you in a master's degree program? <laughs> Maybe it's just a spiritual thing. So Lord, we just declare the spirit of counsel and power uh, over Kellyanne. And we declare that she's going to set captives free in Jesus name, God, in Jesus name. We just bless in Jesus name. So yeah, man, I'm telling you what, when Moses just put himself in that place and trusted God that even though the injustice that had come against him from, from government officials, injustice that had come against him from his own people that were close to him, uh, lack of provisions, he put himself in that place. He came out looking better. But the, here's the good news. The, the glory that was on Moses was a diminishing glory. You know, this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that says that Moses would put a veil over his face. Do you know? I actually remember hearing like Moses put a veil over his face because it was so shiny. He had to keep the people from, you know, the glare was blinding them. That was always my impression of Moses' glory. But actually, Paul sets this straight. He's like, no, no, that was a glory. That glory that was engraved in a stone was a diminishing glory. The reason that he put a veil over his face was because he tried to hide the fact from the people that the glory was diminishing. He, the longer he was away from the presence of God, the glory would diminish. And so he put the veil over his face because he didn't want them to see the glory diminishing because the glory was his authority. The glory was the place at which he exercised authority from. But here's what the Bible says is that you don't have a diminishing glory. You have an ever increasing glory. And there's almost not enough words in English to describe this. This is called an ever increasing glory. It's, it's sort of like the picture is to throw something beyond the horizon. That's the picture of it. Do you throw it beyond the horizon? Is it, is it if you were like, you know, the greatest football quarterback and you could throw it outside. You don't just throw it from the end to the end zone. You throw it out of the stadium. You, you, this is the glory that you've been given. It's not just as far as you can see for your future, it's beyond your horizon. That's the glory you've been given. It's an ever increasing glory. It's beyond the horizon. It's, be, it's beyond the coronavirus. It's beyond the economic downturn. It's beyond, it's ever increasing. It's beyond what you could see. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It's not entered into the imagination of man, the things that God has in store for you. Can I tell you something? That's why we say glory, right? <laughs> That's why we say glory binge. The reason is, is because the promise is that whenever I stay in that place, whenever I keep looking at him, I go beyond what I could do in the natural. 
I go beyond, like I can love people that hate me. I can bless those who curse me. I can pray for those who, who, who speak spitefully against me. Why? Because I can go beyond it. 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 So somebody say, show me your glory, God. And, and, the, and the good thing is, is that whenever we know his ways, we can handle his glory. See, if you don't understand the person of God, you're, you're never going to be equipped to carry the power of God, the glory of God. It, the reason that God could say, I'll show you my glory to Moses was because he didn't ask for just the provision or the people or the plan. The reason was because he actually wanted him. He wanted him. He wanted him. You know, the Lord spoke to me once. I was asking the Lord about some things specifically, and um, I wanted to know, you know, what God wanted to do. And, and the Lord spoke to me and he said, Bob, I love to share with people what's on my mind. I love that. I love to give people the mind of Christ. He goes, but I'm looking for people that I can share my heart with. I really didn't understand what that meant. But he, I, I, as I pondered it, I realized, you know, when you meet someone, they might tell you what's on their mind, but you, you don't really know what's in people's heart until you know them. You might tell people the, the, the thoughts that you're having, but you won't share the secrets of your heart with someone you don't trust. And I want to be that person. And I want to, I want to be that person uh, that, man, that God can tell what's on his heart. I don't, I don't want to just get more prophecy. I, I want to get mature prophecy. I, want to get, I don't want to just hear the mind of Christ. I want to know the heart of God. I want to, I want to know what he thinks. And you know what? He, the Bible says he shares his secrets with his servants the prophets. If you want to know the secrets of God, it's God's heart. You can't just aspire to be a prophet. You, you have to aspire to be a servant because he shares his secrets with his servants, the prophets. If this is what the Lord spoke to me, he said, Bob, if you'll serve people, I'll share the secrets of my heart with you for them. If you serve a nation, I will share with you the secrets of my heart for that nation. If you serve a, a people group, I'll share the secrets of my heart. Come on, I want to. I want to. I want to see His glory. I want to know. I don't know what what's behind what His heart is. I want to know Him. And and the Bible says that you want to know Him. Paul says it. The power of your resurrection, sharing the fellowship of your suffering, be made conformable to your death. See, those are things that don't happen without a process. They don't happen on the mountaintop. They don't happen on the platform. They happen in the secret place. They happen in the cave. Don't run away from this moment that God's given you. Don't run away from the, the, the cleft of the rock. This cleft of the rock is the place where God is preparing you to know the secrets of his heart. This cleft of the rock is a place where God is revealing to you his ways. Don't run away from this time. This is not, this is not man dictating to you that you need to shut things down. This is God telling you, I want to visit you where you are. I want to visit you because I need you to be in this place so I can pass by. I need you to be in this place so I can pass by. I'm here in my prayer room in my house. I just put this uh, room together this year and this, I do prayer and worship here and I just started to do some uh, broadcasting from here, but it's not what it was built for primarily. Um, I had an empty room in my house because I, I had some changes take place in my life. I had my oldest daughter got married at the end of last year and, and uh, if anybody here had a child get, get married, raise your hand, you, you feel it's, it's exciting, it's joyful, you're happy, and then also you feel like somebody died. That's what I say. Somebody says, how's it feel? I say, I'm so joyful. And I also feel like somebody died because sadness and joy can exist in the same space. They're not, they're not competing things. They actually can live together. You know, crisis and faith can live in the same space. Uncertainty and hope can live in the same space. And you know what? I believe that when you, when you embrace the sadness and the joy, you'll actually see a new part of God, right? So this crisis and faith, you're, you, you can go through crisis and have faith. You can go through uncertainty and still have hope. In fact, 
actually that's where hope is is it, it, it springs up you can't have hope if you're certain of what's going to happen it, everybody wants to know what's going to happen well god is saying i want i want to give you a place where you can have hope because a seed of hope is always planted in the soil of uncertainty and if you don't have uncertainty you don't have any need for hope but hope that is seen is not certain at all right it's not certain it's not seen and so the reason i created this room is because i had an empty room in my house and i said to my wife i don't want to have an empty room i want to fill it with something and right now there are spaces that have been created empty they're caves clefts of the rock this is my cave right now right now this is my cave it was my cleft of the rock and you decide what you fill your empty spaces with i said i'm going to fill i want to fill this room with worship and prayer and that's what we did we had an empty space we filled it with worship and prayer you decide right now what are you going to fill your empty space with you're going to fill it with binge watching stuff that's not good for you i want to tell you this is the time to decide what you're going to fill your room with worship and prayer get back to the word i'm preaching now I'm preaching good now don't shout me down don't shout me down all right demetria demetrius moss moss demetrius moss moss Let's talk to Demetrius Moss Moss. God's about to show up Demetrius Moss Moss and show off for you, Demetrius Moss Moss. I feel like the Lord has given you a, a psalmist anointing with a beat. Demetrius Moss Moss, Demetrius Moss Moss, Demetrius Moss Moss. And I, and I feel like the Lord is going to bring new sounds out of you. He's going to bring new sights out of you. And I see um, visuals and sounds coming out of you that are going to, show and demonstrate the kingdom of God. I feel like you're a, a new sound for a new generation. And I feel like God's going to connect the visual arts and the video arts and the musical arts together and release some things out of you. I feel like there's a producing gift in you and God's gonna, been putting you through a process because he's producing something out of you. And there's a producing gift that's going to come out of you that's going to release new sounds uh, to a new generation. So we just bless Demetrius Moss Moss. We just bless him in Jesus name. And we just thank you, God. Thank you for new sounds. Thank you for new sounds, new sounds, new sounds, new sounds, new sounds, new sounds, new sounds. Hey, uh, Ben, ch tell me the name of those people you wanted me to pray for. Boop, 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 boop. Okay, Antoinette, perfect. Antoinette, that's a good name. Haven't heard that name for a while. Uh, Antoinette, I really feel like this is a year where God is going to give a key, put a key in your hand uh, that's going to unlock uh, healing gifts uh, to many people. Oh, sorry, Demetrius Moss Moss. <laughs> that's all right. Word of knowledge is wrong. Prophetic is right. So um, uh, Antoinette, I feel like this is a year where God is going to release healing gifts to you, uh, particularly healing of the heart that is going to release um, healing of the body to people. And I, I saw literally the Lord give you a key that went deep down into people's hearts. And it was an inner healing gift that unlocked things in people's hearts. And when you unlocked them, you didn't just unlock things to their past. Past you, What you did was you, you, you actually opened a door that Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock and anyone that opens to me, I'll enter in. And you're going to help people to bring Jesus into their past and completely rewire uh, their perspective of what God has done. So, yeah, Lord, we just bless her in Jesus' name for that healing gift, that inner healing gift. And Lord, we just bless uh, Mark Sanchez. Um, yeah, let me talk about Mark Sanchez. Mark, there's an entrepreneurial gift in you um, that God has given you, and it's a, an exercise of the prophetic creativity that God's given you. I like to say that Jesus, or Jesus is the is the first entrepreneur. He created everything that we see and don't see uh, in seven days, and he had no resources. And so I believe that God's going to give you um, some spiritual principles from the, cre the account of creation that is going to actually um, unlock some entrepreneurial things. And it has to do even with things that affect the environment. And I feel like the Lord has given you a love for um, stewardship of the environment that's actually going to be an entrepreneurial uh, grace, a social entrepreneurial grace that's going to affect the restoration of the lands. And I see uh, Isaiah 49 over you, or Isaiah 49 says that you will restore the land that I feel like there's even some things that are going to go, you're going to go into developing countries um, and you're going to bring healing to the land and it will affect the, the um, 
environmental systems of it, but I feel like there's some social entrepreneurism um, that God has for you uh, in this next season. So, Lord, we just thank you about for this entrepreneurial gift. We thank you, and it has something to do with water. I see the Lord uh, giving you unlocking like water supplies in places where they don't have water, and there, there's water that's going to flow, and I feel like there's even coming a grace over real estate uh, in this next season. And I feel like you're going to be able to buy land on the cheap, uh, and it's going to uh, be for purposes of God. And I feel like the Lord says, when you buy land, make sure you have the mineral rights locked up because there's there's gold and then there's hills, there's minerals in the ground that God is going to uh, bring out for you. So yeah, we just bless that uh, in Jesus' name, Lord, uh, in Jesus' name. So let, let me just let me just finish this. So let's listen to what Paul says. I want to read this from the beginning because there's a couple things I'm going to leave with you before my time's up here. So now, if the ministry that brought death was engraved in letters of stone came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Say more glorious. If the ministry that condemned men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brought righteousness for what was glorious has no glory in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away, the old covenant, came with glory, how much greater is the glory of Israel? Now, this is what I want you to get. Therefore, since we have such hope, we are very bold. <laughs> the glory makes you very bold. The glory makes you courageous. The, the glory chases away fear. The glory chases away intimidation. What, is, what did Paul say to Timothy? God's not given you a spirit of intimidation, but a power, love, and clear thinking. Power, love, and clear thinking, a sound mind. And I just declare over you a sound mind. I declare over you clear thinking. I, I say to you that you're coming into a greater glory right now. It is chasing away fear. You're going to be very, very bold. You're going to be very, very bold. I want to read something to you before I close and, and pray for you. And um, there's um, some study I've been doing about the Spanish flu that was in the early 1900s. Um, it, was a, it was a worldwide pandemic. And this was, it's interesting because there are things that are happening to us now in the church. We, we aren't told we can't have public meetings. We have to go into our homes and we're actually be given really strict, restrictive things. And I think we need to do really wise things, by the way. So I'm, I'm okay with that. I live just a few hours, you know, a few miles, about 30 miles from New York city. So we're, we're being very wise in it. Um, but here's what I want to tell you. There's a whole part of the church that has been forced to meet in their homes underground, been sequestered and quarantined for years. And I believe that this situation we're in is actually a sign that, the church is going to come out of its houses. The church is going to come out of sequestering. The church is going to come out of quarantine. And I believe at the end of this, the sequestered church, the persecuted church, the hidden church, the underground church in nations of the world is going to hit the streets and they're going to start to raise their voice. And it's very important that we in the Western world raise our voices with them because now we've experienced this, this sequestration. We've experienced this quarantine. We know what it feels like. And the early church experienced this. And when the day of Pentecost came, there came a boldness on them. They got out in the streets and they got out of their houses. And I believe that there's a new boldness that's coming on you uh, in this season. And I just want to share with you um, this story of the church during the Spanish flu. This is a, a, an article that was written all the way back there in the 1900s. When the order to close was issued by the health department on the account of the Spanish influenza, we have held no meetings for the past month, but our time has been taken up more than ever, visiting Christians and seeing salvation and praying with the sick. It is so blessed to see how God is answering prayer and bringing awakening to the lost, saving our relatives, our friends, and our neighbors of those who have got, God has taught to pray by his spirits. There are many that have been ill, but our Christ is graciously healing them all in answer to prayer. This is just about a hundred years ago, almost exactly a hundred years ago. And I believe we're in a hundred year awakening that's happening right now. I believe that God is visiting you in your home and you're becoming very bold. I believe that God is going to 
going to give you boldness in this next season. You don't have to come out of this fearful. You don't have to come out of this broken. You don't have to come out of this uh, broke financially. What you're going to come out of this is filled with his glory. Amen? Amen. Man, what a great time to be with you guys. What a great time to hang out and share this with you. Sorry about the technical difficulties, but we made it. And I just want to just say, Father, show us your glory. Let your glory come in each home. Let your glory come over each household. Lord, let the main marriages be filled with glory. May husbands and wives start to look more like each other in this season because they're spending more time face to face. May, may our future look more like you. May our businesses look more like you. May our, our, our relationships more like you. May our hearts look more like you. God, show us your glory. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for the time that we've had together. In Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Love you. Thanks for hanging out with me. I will see you somewhere or in the air. Be blessed. Bye-bye. Wow, wasn't that so good? So incredible. Bob, we love you. We received all the prophetic ministry again. Gave so profound. Guys, this is not a time for us to shrink back. But this is a time for us to stay in the glory. Come on. Jesus himself said, abide in me. Abide in the vine. And you will abound. Listen, are you getting pruned? Are you getting cut? Are you getting circumcised? Cut, cut, snip, snip. Listen, this is a time where Jesus said, abide in me, for I'm about to cause you to abound and bear much fruit. Amen? And not just fruity pebbles, not just fruity nutty type of things that go away in one bowl of cereal a day, but he's going to cause you to bear much fruit that will last. Come on. It's going to last even longer than these ages. It's going to last beyond your situation, beyond your difficulty, beyond anything you've ever seen. And Jesus is wanting us to abide in him and to cut through because his glory is about to pass. Amen? That was such a good word. You guys received that from Brother Bob. That was incredible. I was blown away. Our team here received. Our team here received. I know some of our other team they didn't receive a word, so they're a little sad, but it's all good because they're a little late. But anyways, but God is favoring you above the rest. Jesus is favoring you above them all. Amen. Someone say, favor is mine. Someone say, favor belongs to my house. Someone say, favor belongs to me. Amen. Come on. Sickness and curses are far, far away from you. They are they're being driven out of your land. They're being driven out of your house. And the favor of God is visiting you. Amen. Guys, God bless you. We love you. Listen, uh, before we just close in a song here, uh, I want to say again, 2 p.m. Someone say 2 p.m. 2 p.m. We're going to have live worship again and some live prophetic painting by painting and worship at the same time. It's going to be incredible. All right. So 2 p.m., live worship, a live prophetic painting. And then we're going to have Jennifer Evad begin to talk to us about some things in our heart. It's going to be incredible. Have you been enjoying this? Amen. So, guys, let's end in a song here. Praise the Lord. And uh, it's going to be incredible. So let's worship the Lord together in Jesus' name. And uh, afterwards, we're going to go to our lunch break. Enjoy. Remember, don't just binge on hot dogs and hamburgers or sandwiches or enchiladas. Go bow and binge in vitamin D, vitamin C, and the vitamin of the Holy Ghost. All right? Bless you guys. Love you. We'll see you soon. Come on, Amanda. Brother Aspen, hit us with some glory. Hallelujah. All right? Bless you. Shalom.
in the name of Jesus. Oh, there is power. In the name of Jesus, there is power. This day, there is power. Just sing out and say, Jesus, Jesus.